it was the uh, NEMF uh, Digital PDI oh, Cup Championship on so Sunday. I'll just watch um, it. Alan sent you all the results out. Um, we came 17th out of 25. Um, we went down a bit in the second round. We, did, we were 14th in the first round. <laughs> went down a bit. But we beat some, you'll see, we beat some very good clubs anyway. So, uh, But, of course, Rolls-Royce won it by street again. They just yeah. there's nobody to compare with them. So, uh, but, but when they won at RB was below us. Yeah, RB was below us. Yeah. Um, yeah. At, at one time, the only LPA club above us was Deepings, but uh, Cleethorpe's passed us in the in the second yeah. round. Yeah. But uh, no, and joy. Uh, congratulations to Mary, who got uh, 15 for uh, let go of my tail. And uh, got a commended, and there's a certificate on the way to her. Well done, Joe. Well, well, well done. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Just yeah. hope you, you get a maximum again at Sheffield, Mary. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah. Sheffield PDI uh, Interclub Knockout is on the 20th i've sent you the details out if there, i've still got a couple of places left if anybody's interested who wants to to watch it seven o'clock on the saturday night the 20th have you sent those out david for Sheffield? no not yet i haven't sent oh, the contact right, okay. details the but, login so, details out fantastic. david i sent i sent an email to you but i didn't get anything back who's that linda linda spoke I didn't get anything from you, Linda. Right. If, if you don't hear back from him, send it again. Yeah. Okay. And I, I clear my junk, I check my junk every day, so because I get no end of stuff going there. So yeah. I didn't I didn't get anything from you, Linda. Okay. You got my email address from Alan though, haven't you? Yeah. George. George, we've okay. two names. We've two names on George. I don't know if you want to ask them to. Who is that? Introduce themselves. Martin and... Martin and Jonathan Boker. Martin's my brother. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. Welcome, Martin, my brother. <laughs> Linda, do you right. want me to put you down for Sheffield? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Okay. Is that it, David? Yeah, yeah thank you. It's all right. All right, everybody. What uh, I mentioned last week that... We were looking for someone to take over the internal club secretary, uh, competition secretary. And I can, I am pleased to say that Owen Kennedy has agreed to do the job. Oh, so nice. thank you very much, Owen. Oh, bless you, fellow. And you oh, wave, yeah. Owen, so we know who you are. He's, there he is. There he is. I'm proud. Okay. I'm uh, if anybody, if Owen, if you need any questions answering, just please let any one of the committee know, and uh, we'll only be too pleased to help. I, I will be having a committee meeting next week sometime, but I'll let you know when. Is that it? Yeah. Anybody else? Competition. Right. <clears throat> Sorry, Mary. Competition next week program. Competition next week. Yeah. Uh, now, it's uh, my duty to introduce David Spate. He is an English landscaper and he lives somewhere near Leeds. I don't know what club he's a member of, but I'm sure he's going to tell us. So, David, thank you very much for joining us. Right, I'm, I'm going to mute everybody. And can you uh, probably close down your screens just to improve the bandwidth? And then, David, you have to unmute yourself once I've muted everybody. Right, so I'll just share the screen. Yeah, we've got that. Has everybody got that now? Yeah. And everybody can hear okay? Yep. Yes. Right, then I think we're about ready there then. So, so yeah, my name's David Spate. 
Uh, I'm a landscape photographer um, full time now for about the last six years. Um, and I've been into landscape photography fairly seriously, probably for about at least the last 20 years. Um, I got into photography in quite a, a bit of a strange way, really, as you can see from this picture. Um, it all started with these slimy fish. Um, I was chasing up and down the country um, fishing for pike and once in a while I mean I can't claim to be the best pike angler out there by, by a long long way but once in a while I'd catch a good fish um, but the pictures never did the, did the fish justice um, I'd always had an interest in being outside because of my dad my dad took me fishing when I was three year old um, so what basically happened um, I sort of, uh, I, I was into my fishing, as I say, and, and, and what I thought I would do eventually was to, to buy like a, a, a good camera. Um, and I sort of started off a friend in the Lake District, um, happened to be selling a, a film SLR, this very one, an EOS 3000. Um, and I saw it and thought, one of these big black boxy professional cameras, obviously, if you get one of them, you've cracked it. Your pictures are going to just go for it. This is just going to skyrocket in, in, um, you know, in quality overnight. But as we all know, that sort of rarely happens, really. Um, and, I, and I got this new camera, the film camera, um, put it into practice, and my pictures were still rubbish. But what it did do, it kind of got me interested a little bit in finding out how it worked or trying, um, uh, and trying to understand photography a bit more. And the other, the other pretty weird thing that happened at the time was when I was sat around waiting for one of these um, monster pipes to come along, which didn't happen very often, I had plenty of time, so I started kind of dabbling a bit with landscape photography. Um, and at that time, I sort of thought my pictures were, were looking good. Um, I think I bought some grad filters, like everybody does coking ones, um, except the ones I got were all, they were like purple grads and green grads and all sort of weird, sorts of weird colours. And at that time, as I say, I thought the pictures looked fantastic. I mean... Who don't love a green sky or a, you know, a purple sky? Um, but obviously, they were not that good. When I started moving on and looking at kind of, but I, I started to need some inspiration. So, like a lot of people, um, I was sort of looking at books, buying all these magazines, but flicking through all these different um, photographers' work. I realized that my stuff were, were actually <laughs> just totally rubbish, you know, absolutely, absolutely terrible. Um, but it did give me something to aspire to, you know. So I started working harder at it. Um, but still, still really, while I were actually going fishing, that was the thing. It, it were always a the, the, the landscapes that I took were a byproduct of where I was fishing. Um, you know, and if that went back at gas works or wherever it was, obviously your options were a bit limited. Um, but that's kind of how I got started. Now, sort of moving on, this was my first digital camera. Um, again, you can tell, I don't know if anybody remembers it. They're, they're always Canon, because we all know Canon do the best uh, cameras for, for most photography like um, but the uh, the PowerShot Pro 1 I bought this camera still with the kind of fishing images in mind the one thing it had at the time it had a brilliant flip round screen so you know when you see these pictures of me sort of looking slightly bewildered there um, you've actually got a little a little cart, one of those little infrared remotes, and it's usually like 
the, the look is to say, is the camera actually working? Is it firing a picture off? Is it not? You know, have, have, is it focusing correctly? Or, um, but yeah, the, the PowerShot Pro One um, tended to be really good for self takes. Um, and I'd have to say, it began to get me more into landscape photography. Um, whereas when I'd been taking the pictures with a film camera, obviously, it, it was a, um, I'd be dashing to sort of Asda and getting my pictures developed. And I'd be sat in my car at the time, which were like a Nova 1.2. And I'd be rifling through all these prints and basically throwing them on the floor of the car in, in disappointment and sort of going, you know, rubbish, 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 rubbish. And there might be one out of a, up from a film that I thought, ah, you know, this one's got a little bit of potential. But apart from that, you know, it was pretty hard going and I, I, I'm not progressing too much. But with digital, obviously, and that instant feedback, I began to look and sort of um, assess my work a little bit more and probably began to see a few improvements then, you know, so... So moving on to my first proper camera, or the, the first proper camera, as I'd call it at that time, um, another Canon, the 20D. And I, at this point, I was getting more serious about actual landscape photography. And so much so, um, I don't know if anybody else remembers that point that they actually did this, but I know for me at the time, it was quite weird because the... The photography had all, always been a byproduct of something else. If I went for a walk, if I went fishing, you know, I'd take the camera and I might try and get some pictures. Um, but probably just prior, yeah, just prior to getting the 20 D, um, I did the first sort of day uh, where I just went out solely to take pictures. And that felt quite strange in a way, but it just happened. and. Sort of overnight, I went from being this mad keen um, fisherman chasing up and down country after fish um, to getting more into photography. My kids had been born around that time, and I think it sort of felt I, I've got to be out. I've got to be out in the countryside, no matter what, as much as possible. And I've always been like that. Um, but the kids being born, and I, I were working nights at the time. I felt like I could justify photography more because I started to look at maybe selling an odd print or seeing if I could make a bit of money from it. Possibly, at that point, really, just to pay for my kit. The 20D there that I bought was like a big, I suppose, a big investment at that time and one that were a bit, a bit worrying, especially when you've got young kids coming along, you know. So... Um, but thankfully, it began to pay off a little bit. I, I had started at that time to put images onto some of the stock libraries. I kind of wish I'd have put more on now because it was it were like the golden day of the, the stock libraries back then, really. And it's just not it's not the same anymore. Um, but I don't know if anybody remembers it. This was my my first published image, um, and it was in two thousand and seven. It's an image of Crackpot Hall at Swaledale, if anyone's been. Um, but it appeared in a book um, called Britain's Favourite View. Uh, and it were actually, the, the programme were on TV. Not that this image was, it only appeared in the book. But for me at that time, I'd sort of, you know, you know when you're kind of sceptical about things, what's, you know, and you're thinking like, well, somebody will actually pay me for my photographs, you know, and you're not sure anyway. This image sold for the book, and I think it made about 100, just over 100 quid. And, and at that time, I was jumping for joy. I thought, what? You know, somebody's going to pay me 100 and odd pound for a picture. Um, so obviously, it's quite an addictive buzz then. So I wanted to sell more. So I, I still, as I said, my problem back then, I was working nights a lot of the time, so I had me my sort of weekends to take pictures. Um, and I kind of dipped my toe in and I wish, 
if I had been able to, I'd have got more on there while the prices on stock libraries were quite good because they're obviously it's nearly not worth bothering now. It's still still a bit, but it's not great. Um, so shortly after that, I had another bit of success, and you can see, I mean, this fantastic image, <laughs> and, and I'm saying that jokingly because it's not. Um, but I got I got a, a, an inquiry from Ordnance Survey um, about an image that I had on my website. Um, Anyway, the, to cut a long story short, it was for a big ad advertising campaign that they were doing. Um, and they were willing to pay quite a bit of money, which it, it really kind of, um, it was a bit of a shock. Um, but anyway, the, the images that they picked off my website, they were actually an advertising agency that were working for Ordnance Survey. Um, and this company, sort of took the images and they did a mock-up like where, where um, the Ordnance Survey maps have all the symbols on them. Their, their idea was to put all these symbols onto the image and then they were going to use it like it was going to be used on the internet, on the map stands and just, just everything that Ordnance Survey do basically the image were going to appear. Um, anyway, when they did it, the Ordnance Survey actually told them, well, if you're going to show like a church symbol there and a footpath symbol over here, those things have to be in the image. So the images that they'd originally chosen then didn't really fit. They didn't work for this particular brief. So not to be outdone, I said, well, if you want me to, I can go out and try and get some images like that. And they literally gave me a weekend. And as you can imagine, as I say, I don't want to go on about this for too long, but the weather was kind of okay. But, you know, there's a lot of factors after sort of a line to get, get some of those fantastic images and, and fit in with what they wanted. But luckily they took this image and another one. Um, and at the time, it, they made about, well, they, eventually they made nearly £10,000 over a few years. Um, so, it, as you can imagine, it kind of got me more and more interested in selling my images and, and what I've, even though I were working, I've worked for 30 years in engineering. Um, so, the ambition back then was just to really, I suppose, sell enough pictures so that I could buy new kit. Um, and, and going on, you know, the kit that you need for landscape photography, um, there's nothing particularly special, you know, you, obviously tripods, um, some people will tell you you don't need a tripod and I mean I'm in one of the, uh, those in the camp where I just think that um, tripods are, a, are an essential item, you know, and I know it's pretty obvious but you can get away. Cameras are getting like higher, better, high ISO performance. So they are getting better in that way. Um, but as I said, the kit I have, nothing special. Benro tripods, I really recommend them. Really durable, uh, really good value for money. And they have some actually sturdy, you know, quite lightweight, compact ones. The ones I have. Um, you know, you could pull vault a river with it nearly, you know, it's quite a, a bit of a beast, but um, they're very good value for money. I also have a Gitso, a big Gitso 5 series, which is, uh, well, even more sturdy, but it weighs a ton. Your arms are dragging on the floor carrying that thing about. Um, this is one of the items that I probably wouldn't be without. I know it's, uh, you know, talking about gear, but the, the basics probably... The one thing that, that is one of those, um, it's kind of taken for granted a little bit now, but um, the L bracket, whenever you're using a, you know, because we're obviously we're using a tripod such a lot, the L brackets, even a cheap sort of universal L bracket means that you can spin your camera around pretty quick. Um, but not only that, your camera's not offset on the tripod, so it's, it's just a lot more sturdy. And your, and your tripod head, if you whether you use ball heads or geared heads, um, on an L bracket, you tend to get a bit more movement on your camera. It's a bit easier. 
So that's one of the things I certainly would um, recommend. Um, the only the only bits of kit really, as I say, I mean, I use a, a range of lenses from round about sixteen millimeters up to two hundred. Now I, I have used much longer lenses, but that's my general sort of kit. So nothing sort of out of the ordinary. It, it's basically um, an ultra wide angle on full frame, which is a sixteen to thirty five. Uh, and then I've got a 24 to 70, which is your standard sort of zoom. Uh, and then I've got a 70 to 200. And as I said, the only two bits of kit that are not so much different, but if I want to do something different, I have a Canon 180 macro, this one, which is, um, that's a bit of a beast. It's quite a heavy macro lens. And it is more, uh, you can see with the foot, it's, a, it's, it's one for a tripod. It's not really a hand-holding one. Um, but in my, um, my sort of approach to photography is try to adapt to conditions rather than complain that the weather's not right or the, you know, the landscape's boring. I think all those things are, obviously if it's torrentially raining, then that might be a different matter. But... I tend to think that if you can adapt to your conditions, your surroundings, there's always a good shot to take. And, and having the right kit, the macro lens is another option, you know, for, for flower stuff, but also for close-up details, patterns and things like that. So I like having that in my bag. Um, but it's probably why my back's crumbling now as well, because I can never leave any, any kit at home tend to think I need it all. Um, my, other, my other sort of um, lens that I really like, and I'll come on to this a bit more later, but is the Tilt Shift 24 millimeter. Uh, I don't know if anybody's used those much, but, but um, that's very good, especially for doing um, quite wide angle. And by that, I mean close up panoramics, because you can, you can shift the lens and stitch the images together and it, it'll give you, whereas when you're doing ordinary panoramics, you usually have to use like a 50 millimeter lens or, or thereabouts. And it, it, it gives you a certain um, perspective. The 24 mil means you can get close and get, get panoramic images that have like close foreground detail. And I like that, it gives me more versatility and I can get different images than what might be the norm from a from a location you know so um yeah you'll notice canon canon camera bodies and things like that um i do think that um the 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 canon gear although i've al always used it and, and in fact the workshops that i run i'm using other people's um camera equipment more than i am my own equipment so um, some of the things I really like, uh, the, the Canon screens have always been fantastic. And that is like from the, the very top of the range, but down to the entry level ones. Um, and, and again, I think I talk about it a little bit later, but live view, live view focusing and things like that it, with your, the Canon cameras. Don't get me wrong now, because some of the other cameras are, are getting just as good, but it, you know, Canon have been like that for a long time where you've been able to magnify um, such as your foreground or elements in your foreground and focus them. And, and, and using like depth of field preview, you can maximize uh, and get, get your images pin sharp from, back to, from front to back. Uh, it's quite easy to do, very simple, um, and you almost take it for granted once you can, once you do it. But it, it's one of those things that it's been awkward on some of the cameras, um, you know, over the years. So I, I like my equipment basically to just be it, it, it sits there. I don't have to think about camera technique. It, it just works seamlessly, and I can concentrate on the things that really matter, composition, light, time in the shot, 
uh, and everything worked as it can. I, I, I absolutely can't stand it when, you know, you, you, you've got a camera and you accidentally touch it or and it changes settings and things like that. It just, you know, landscape's not the hardest thing and it's not the most complicated, but you kind of need your equipment just to sort of seamlessly sit in background, really, um, and not be fiddly. That's the thing. One or two other bits, I, I sometimes use a panoramic head um, for making panoramas, but apart from that, as I said, not, nothing really complicated there. Um, yeah, so moving on, influencers. When you talk about influencers in landscape photography, um, I think, you know, when we go back to the beginning and I needed inspiration, then you know, certainly I got influence and inspiration from, you know, the Joe Cornishes, David Ward, David Norton, Guy Edwards, all these people who were, who were taking landscape photos at that time. But the more, as you go on, um, for me anyway, it's more about enjoying the process that, that you go through to get a photograph. And... I really try not to be influenced. I'm more, more nowadays, I'm more interested in, in sort of finding my own um, locations, preferably where not everybody's going. And, and in some cases, not the most dramatic of locations, you know, sometimes the, the less dramatic, because if you can create a photograph um, and you can create the drama, through composition uh, and good light, then you've succeeded and it's harder to do. We all know some of the uh, more dramatic places such as Scotland, and, and I'm not for a minute saying it's easy to take photographs in those places. Um, but, you know, it, you do have that kind of drama on a plate. You know, we've got places that I visit quite a lot, the, the, the dales, the wolds, and everything's in a, on a smaller scale. It's not so mountainous and, you know, and, and my, my enjoyment is, is more sort of, um, you know, or, or the other one is, is going to a well-known view um, and finding a new angle, you know. So as I say, I don't really want to be influenced too much uh, and, and I mean, that's a difficult thing to do, I would say, you know, it, it, you, we're probably all influenced in some ways, but as I say, my, my aim is to not be too influenced, you know, and you can see here, like, big area um, near, up above Settle in the Dales, but I look at these images as, as my sort of images, you know, you've got Penigan in the background there. And, uh, you know, obviously the, dale, the character of the dales with the limestone and stuff. Um, this one at Wharfdale, it's up, uh, if anybody's been over to Kettlewell. Um, but I enjoy trying to not follow that, you know, the, the, what's been before. I like to try and, try and create my own sort of images. Or that, that's the thing I enjoy most. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, if you're starting out with landscapes, it's obviously a good exercise to try and look at other photographers and maybe, maybe recreate some of those images to find out what it is that makes them work. Then maybe we can apply them, you know, to, to, to a different scenario. Um, but on the whole, as I say, I quite like to, to try and make my own images. I mean, you can see uh, this is one from up on Pike Door Hill at Malham. It's sort of above Malham. Uh, and you're looking down over, uh, let me see if my little pointer will work. Ah, there you go. Does, does that actually come across? I don't know if that's coming across on the screen. But over on that's the right of the picture, um, you'd be looking down to sort of Malham Village. I think it's a September image you know and when you think at Dales and it, it, I would imagine if you do a search for images of Malham there'll be a thousand pictures come up of a, a tree on the limestone that you see 
going up the hill, you know. So the challenge is just to try and try and capture something a bit different, really. Um, yeah, one of my favourite sort of images, this one up from up at Swaledale. Um, and, and again, it's that classic sort of Dales, Yorkshire Dales shot with the barns and the fields, the dry stone wall, walls, but it, it worked out a really simple composition just with the, the hill dropping down and the rolling curve of the field. Um, but it's surprising sometimes how difficult it can be, be to see such a simple composition, or certainly for me anyway. I'm, I'm certainly by no means a natural. I have, to, I have to really look and I have to really try things and experiment. But I tend to experiment things <laughs> to, the, to the, the, the extent that eventually I get onto, you know, what I think is beginning to work. Uh, and this were one of those kind of, um, you know, one of one of those times really. Um, another one, probably one of the most dramatic areas at Dales, I think, up up above Crumock Dale, uh, up above Ostwick at Crumock Dale. But again, sort of my image, just the layers looking down. As I said, not really. I, I wouldn't, or I, I couldn't really think of any influences on that. It's just a go for a walk, you know, and, and see what we see what we come back with. Um, and as I said, one of, one of the other things about that, I, I think what I said earlier, I tend to think that um, whatever kind of landscape you're looking at, um, I've heard photographers say before that uh, a certain landscape might be not dramatic enough or, you know, a little bit boring or you know, and I tend to think that the more landscape photography you actually do, um, you get to a point where if we're presented with a, a, a really dramatic looking landscape, and obviously the light and other things have a part to play, but it's not too difficult to get a successful image. Now it becomes more difficult when, we're, when we have to really search and really look for those elements that, that you know, in a less dramatic landscape, and try and try and sort of um, uncover those things and make them more prominent, you know, and that tends to be how I think on landscape photography. Maybe it's a bit backward. I don't know. Maybe that was why sometimes, you know, some of the pictures that I, that I, that I take, um, you know, they, they're not gonna they're not gonna go down as um, you know world beaters but you, you, it's very rewarding to know that you've you think you've got the best image that you can even from a as I say a landscape that's maybe not quite as dramatic we will come to some of them a bit later as well so um, yeah I mean camera technique um, camera technique for landscape I think we've already said a little bit about that but um, you probably know, but it's not particularly complicated. You know, there are much more complicated types of photography, um, you know, and photography where you've not got a lot of time to decide what you're doing now. The one mistake I think that I see a lot of people make is when it comes to camera technique, I, I get the feeling some people think you've got to go out into the landscape or you know travel somewhere nice to actually practice um now for me running workshops what i find is the easier obviously i get people coming and on a day when we go out I, I teach um both both elements but in a lot of ways what you need to do if you want to improve at, at landscape but i would i would guess that at any type of photography actually you need to get to know your kit 100% inside out. You need to know certain techniques. Um, but the beauty is you don't have to travel 50 miles to somewhere dramatic to practice camera technique. You can set things up in your garden, in your living room. And I, and, and I often get people to do this. And you can practice it and practice it. And what you would find is that 
if you get to know your camera, and and when I say your camera, there's so much on cameras nowadays, there's a lot of it you don't need to know, especially the landscapes anyway. But once you get to know those features on your camera that help you get well exposed, very sharp images, that goes to the back of your mind. It's, it's no different to driving. And what happens is your mind opens up and we, we start really looking at composition uh, and lighting and really noticing things that we wouldn't have done before. We'd have been, we'd have been like thinking, right, what, what setting do I have on here? What, you know, what number does this want to be? What lens should I be? Um, you know, and it, we, we kind of halfway betwixt and between in both elements of photography, basically. So the, the technical and the artistic. So my recommendation is always to learn the technical side of photography as best you can at home so that when you actually go out, we just forget it. As I say, it's like riding your bike, driving your car, flying a car, whatever it is you do. And that way you will see um, major improvements in your photography because we start to really, really look. And when I say really look, it's, it's that depth of, of looking at a landscape and really, you know, picking out the key elements that helps. Um, but on the subject of, of camera technique, the image here, the, this type of image, it's just showing really um, using large depth of field. I think we all know when, when we actually focus for an image, um, if we want good front to back sharpness, your focal plane will be around about a third of way into the image. Um, but again, I'd always suggest practice at home with your lenses, um, maximizing depth of field. And by that, I don't mean just whack the aperture up to F16 or whatever. Learn the distances that you get from that lens because we don't want other things creeping in like diffraction. You, you need to learn you know, how much depth of field you get at F11, how much you get at F14 and roughly with your lens and, and things like that help again, because you, you just don't think about it anymore. You go out and it's, it's simple. I know we've not all got the North Sea flowing into the back garden. We've not got a waterfall, but again, you know, long exposures, we need to, we need to experiment. We can, we can, basically test things out maybe on a local stream i don't know and and get that that kind of variation in in shutter speed where you know you've got the i don't know round about a 15th to a quarter of a second and maybe slightly more i'll give you some detail the waves kind of sweeping back leaving shapes on the beach right up to going into sort of minutes and completely smoothing all the water out. Again, you know, because it, it's all about your vision. The more you, you kind of see what you want to achieve before you actually press that shutter button, learning all these techniques are, are going to help you. And you can experiment, you can get different results. Uh, things like focus stacking. These two images are both focus stacked. Um, I'm very close to these rocks, both in Northumberland. Uh, again, but you can practice this at home. You, you don't even need, you know, a playing card or a book on a table. Your camera on a tripod, you can focus the text of the book and practice um, moving your focus in and taking multiple shots and then merging them after in Photoshop so that Basically, when you come to an actual real life um, subject such as these, uh, all you're thinking about again is the composition because it's that that's going to stand out, not the fact that it's you know sharp enough. It, it'll stand out if it's not sharp enough, obviously. But um, but they're the things that we want to be looking at. Um, again, grad filters or exposure blending. This one. Um, it's, a, it's a blend of about five images just to keep some detail in the, the sun sort of sink in there. 
Um, but again, it, it, you don't have to go to Whitby to see a nice sunset. You can do it over the back garden, garden fence or whatever. It doesn't matter how messy that composition is. The point is, at practice until the image, the exposures that you're blending or using your filters are perfect. Practice it, practice it, practice it. So that when you go out, you don't have to think about it. You know when that key moment is, where the light's at its best, everything converges, your composition's perfect. Because you spent more time on that than actually looking at numbers on the back of the camera screen. Um, so that that's quite a big, a big part of uh, the photography, obviously, the, the camera technique. Um, and as I said, the, the Canon cameras for me, I like, but I use a lot of different cameras now. There are no bad cameras about, you know, they, they all work. I don't think they make, they don't make cameras specifically for landscape photographers, unfortunately. A lot of the stuff on there you don't need and some of it, you know, you, you, the cameras could be a lot simpler for me. Basically, I, all, all I'd really need is... Um, good durability, good weather sealing, um, able to take a wave crashing over it. That would be, that'd be quite a good one. <laughs> um, but apart from that, you know, the, the, as I said, the techniques uh, need to be learned sort of beforehand so you can progress through uh, composition and things like that. Um, so moving on, the, uh, the, the locations I tend to shoot uh, you might have seen or you might be beginning to get an idea now. Um, but, you know, how lucky are we to sort of live in Yorkshire when you think about it? I mean, I live, I said, mentioned earlier, I, I'm from near Leeds and where we live, um, it's not the best place, to be honest. It's not the nicest. It's a bit noisy. We, we're near, quite near a, a main road. But within an hour... Um, I can be in the Dales where I, I tend to spend two or three days a week or when I was a landscape photographer before this year, that, uh, anyway, and hopefully again in you know, a few weeks, I think hopefully we'll be, we'll be getting up and running again. Um, but yeah, the, the Dale, even the Dales, when you just think of the Dales, the diversity in the Dales, um, sort of with all the, the rolling fields, these limestone gorges, the dry stone walls and the barns, um, you know, the waterfalls, the, the limestone pavements, the hills, just the dales on its own has like massive diversity and so many different landscapes to practice on. And, and each one just presents a different challenge. So for... for, for kind of learning and learning about composition, you just can't beat it because it's, as I say, it's so diverse. But Yorkshire, um, on top of that, you know, when you add on again, sort of an hour and a half for me, probably a bit closer for you for you guys, the coast, uh, you know, looking over Robin Hood's Bay, the coast again, you know, with uh, the heather up on Moors there, uh, at sea, North Sea, down at Scarborough there at the uh, Spa Bandstand. But again, you know, unique challenges, perfect for, um, you know, sharpening your skills of composition and technique and everything. Um, and then coming back, Yorkshire Worlds. I don't know if anybody gets to the Yorkshire Worlds, but it, it's a place... I've been photographing it for years, but I probably... I probably um, photographed it a bit years ago and then concentrated sort of massively on the Dales because that kind of worked well for, for workshops and stuff. And the last, what, probably, I don't know, five, six years, maybe a bit, no, probably a little bit more, I, I've gone back there and really enjoyed it for more sort of graphic composition. As I say, again, it, it's a completely different challenge to the Yorkshire Dales. And it, it's a place where uh, the thing I find amazing is that you can, you can go over there 
one week, let's say in March, and you will pass like where all the fields are ploughed, the crops are being put in, there's, there's geometric patterns and things everywhere to, to sort of look for. But you'll go back two or three weeks later and it's changed again. The colours have changed. The, the patterns may have changed. And you've just got a new challenge again. It's, it's like a new, um, completely new area. Um, you know, so, I mean, the, both of these images are, are late summer images, a bit of stormy stormy weather and stormy light coming through there at, at um, Thixendale. Uh, and this is my new favourite field. That might sound a bit sad, but I've had so many pictures from this one field. You'll, you'll get. I will. I will bore you with them soon because there are there are plenty more of them to come. But um, but yeah, this this one particular field, I, I've had so many images, and it's changed so much in a short space of time. It, it gives some brilliant compositions. Um, but yeah, and then locally, local to me, I grew up at Lower Hopton near Murfield, and this is this is actually a, a wood that we um, used to, well, we actually sort of used to, I think we might have bunked off school once or twice, and this was our place to go and hide and mess about, but over the years, we, we got up to all sorts of mischief there. Um, and for me, one of the, it, it were always, I've been back there loads of times to take photographs and I've always struggled to get a good image um, or one that I was satisfied with. I, mediocre, I've had a few images that were okay. Um, but this one particularly more in thick fog and, uh, and it looked perfect. And, and, you know, turning the camera around, it was as if you, you just couldn't go wrong. Um, but again, it's one of those things. I think it's important to get to know your local areas, you know, and very close to home, even if, even if they're maybe not as dramatic as some of the places. For all the reasons that I mentioned earlier, don't think or, or don't look too um, deeply at your actual results. It's the process. And it's the knowing that you've done the best that you actually can when you've worked on it. And, you, you know, it might be a local where you take the dog for a walk or whatever, but you tend to get to know where the light's coming from. You know, you'll notice one or two things because you've walked it so many times, you'll notice one or two things that might make a nice shot. Now, I can guarantee you that if you put if you work on your local sort of landscape and try and make the best images you can, it will improve your, your images when you do get to a slightly more dramatic area and, and get a bit more, um, you know, involved or, or do a bit of traveling sort of thing. Um, these, are, these are just local uh, images from, as I say, from near me, uh, 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 these are up at Breton, if anybody knows, it's, it's just on outskirts of Wakefield. It's about 20 minutes. This lone tree always looks nice and it, it's probably due for the oilseed rape again either. Well, I would think either this year or maybe next year. I don't know, it's been a few years since that were planted, but it, it's no marks for composition to be fair, but it's a, it does look really good. It's your perfect lone tree in the, the middle of a field. Um, same one you can see there. This one's just a, a black and white shot of that, but, but locally. Um, and yeah, as I, I, I have quite a few um, visits up to Scotland in a year, usually with workshops now. Um, and if anybody recognises this, this is up at Kilchurn Castle. Fantastic area. And as I said, some of the, uh, you know, the, the, it's so dramatic, you know, the hills and the mountains, the castles and the, the locks, and especially when you get the, the conditions. It, it, for me, images like this, uh, you know, and this one um, did pretty well in the landscape photographer of the year, a couple of years back. Um, but it's a shame. They always pick that 
that image that hits you in the face, you know, the, it, the conditions are amazing. But in truth, we, you know, we all know they're not the most difficult pictures to take, really. There's not the most work goes in, you know, composition-wise, but, you know, fantastic. Again, Lockhart um, and some lovely sort of sunrise conditions. So really dramatic. Finally, probably... Uh, uh, sorry, the Lake District, yeah, got to Lake District quite a bit, pause water, and again, you know, talking a couple of hours for me, um, but obviously a fantastic place, I run workshops up there as well, this is the um, at Hawes Water, up on the Corpse Road it's called, if anybody's been up there, uh, and another, another cracking location. And at Blee Town. But again, you know, I'm not saying it is easy or, or easier, but you know, it's a little bit more dramatic than the, the local areas, such as the the Dales and, and round Yorkshire. Um, but well worth the the rewards. Finally, on these these locations, I, I, I get up to Northumberland quite a bit. Northumberland's probably my favorite sort of coastal location there's so much up there but i also i started to go go in land a bit up there some of the countryside up there there's the odd nice waterfall that breaks things up on uh, when we're up there on on some of these autumn workshops uh, the coast like here at amble looking at the little lighthouse i don't know if anybody's been up there um but winter winter image november um or up at Berwick, I tend to I tend to get up to where, uh, basically from around Berwick or even a little bit higher up at North Berwick, uh, right down to sort of Amble and Almouth around that way, uh, and it's fantastic. The geology as well um, at Northumberland, some of those coastal areas is is fantastic, you know. And I've got some images that I'll show you as we go on. So going on to landscape, obviously wouldn't be landscape without these uh, seasonal sort of highlights, you know, and, and we're, we're not far off um, one of them. We, we, obviously, we, we've come through winter this year and, and been in lockdown. Um, we've actually done pretty well for snow and, and I was just kicking myself because, you know, I couldn't go anywhere. We'd, we'd snowfall after you know, after snowfall, really, or, or a bit more than we've had in recent years, anyway. Um, but I were unable to get out anywhere, so it's uh, as I say, a bit more gardening and DIY this year. Um, but yeah, this is Hebden Bridge again, West Yorkshire, probably thirty or forty minutes away from me. Um, you know, but but snowy conditions tend to simplify a scene, and again, you know that the they often you'll notice probably, but you get snow in an area, and sometimes it, it where where a spot you may not have taken a picture before, um, you get the snow and it simplifies a scene, and suddenly it looks fantastic. Um, you know, here again in Dales. Uh, this is up above Settle, smear set scar, uh, but winter conditions, probably one of, if not my favourite time of year, most years, as I said, possibly not this year, um, because we've just been stuck in, so, you know, a bit heartbreaking to see it this year, but other years, yeah, winter, favourite time. Spring, obviously, the bluebells, um, Local to me again. This is a, this is just down at Brighouse, a long lens to um, compress the 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 tree stumps, and it's a bit messy in this wood where I go. So I quite like this image with the softer background and that sharp sharp trunk in the foreground. But you know, it's a it's a slightly different different challenge down there. There's a lot of different species of trees that that can sort of clutter a, a composition up so this one worked out as a favorite um 
but yeah, the the those kind of if you if you think about spring, you always think of that. There's a real fresh uh, green to like the grass and like new new leaves on trees and and things like that and um, such as such as here in the worlds near Friday Thorpe, another sort of favourite area. Um, it's all the the barley or whatever before it starts to to sort of turn later in the year. I, I, I do like panoramics as we'll get on to as well. Um, you know, but spring, a great time. If you know areas where you get this kind of new growth, trees or the, the fields, um, it doesn't always last long. You get into sort of summer and the, the greens all tend to kind of merge together, but spring's another, another highlight. Um, spring, early summer, Obviously, the oilseed rape, I really like to, to capture that. And so I'm quite lucky because this is only around 20 minutes away for me. And a simplest composition ever, but it's um, one, of, one of the few places you take shots, you know, with a summer blue sky and white clouds because of the contrasting colours. Um, they work really well, even on a nice sunny day. Um, moving into summer, the Dales, I don't know if any of you get up, get up to Dales, but 1st of June or around that time, you start to see all the buttercups uh, in the hay meadows. This one's at Wensleydale. The, the more, I suppose, famous ones are at, at Swaledale. Um, but yeah, the, the, that's, a, that's a good one to look out for. It's well worth making a, a visit to Dales if you get that nice kind of day. It doesn't have to be so sunny, I don't think either. I doubt it one here. It's probably a bit overcast. But um, those colours of the fields, um, you know, contrast nicely on a, on a sort of overcast day. It doesn't have to be, you know, bright sunlight all the time. The heather, obviously, uh, moving into sort of late summer. Heather, um, you know, a lot of these things to remember with them is that I, I tend to make plans to shoot God knows how many different locations in heather season or autumn or whatever. And then you, you realise it actually the peak of it. You know, sometimes you're lucky if it lasts a week or, you know, maybe maybe 10 or 12 days and you realise actually you only, you only sometimes manage to get, you know, a couple of visits to spots. But uh, it's well worth, so it's well worth getting out for the heather. And again, sort of early summer, May time, I really do love the the May blossom. Some of you might recognise this one. It's Castle Howard uh, with a dome from the house in background. But what I love is the it, it feels like a really colourful image, but it's obviously like it's it's English colours. You know, we see some of these images from uh, parts of America with all these really bright colours and. It's just a typical English sort of scene with the, the May blossom, a misty morning with like a pastel sort of sky and uh, beautiful area. You know, it early starts at that time of year for a sunrise, but um, I do love the, the, the May blossom when that comes out, especially in the worlds. It's a little bit later in the worlds. Um, I think it can be, it can be getting into June when it's coming out or a couple of weeks into June, but well worth, well worth getting out and searching out. Um, so yeah, autumn, autumn colours, don't need much um, talking about there, but uh, autumn again, yeah, definitely one of those times, one of my most popular times, everybody wants to get out and photograph uh, places in autumn. And this one's in the world's road, near the roadside, actually, on the way towards Bridlington at Bracy Bridge. Uh, there's a lot of trees planted here in lines. It's a bit boggy, but it's a, it's a really nice spot. The mist, obviously, helps soften the background and just simplify the scene quite a bit. Um, but, you know, if you're shooting woodland, then that's always a, a, a good time to go, which I'm sure you'll you'll have seen anyway. Um, Hardcastle Crabs, I'll talk more about these. I, I like, I quite like square images. 
Um, if the fit, obviously, you know, landscape doesn't just fit into one format um, and, and, and varying, really, as I said, looking at how you want to compose images. Um, these are actually the, the, the shot with the tilt and shift that I mentioned earlier. And they're actually three landscape photos, which are taken with the tilt shift lens and stitched together like a panoramic. And it, it would create an image that is like a 5-4 aspect ratio. So it's finally just cropped to square. But what it means in essence is um, you stitch the images together and rather than cropping, you end up with an image that is bigger than the original file size. But you can get it to the format that you actually saw while you were on, on location. So the the, the square format worked quite well there. Um, so you recognise that Lake District, but then nice autumn colour uh, and nice light. I don't think I've seen it like that many times. You could usually surf down there when I when I go there. Um, but that particular year, we, we did get some fantastic conditions. Uh, yeah, another one to look out for, maybe not quite as obvious, but um, getting into September, really. Once we get into September, um, I know I can, I can sort of feel it by the, the weather through the day is still quite warm, you know, but you might open doors or let dog out on a night or whatever, and you notice the clouds have, the clouds have disappeared and there's a real nip in the air. Um, and it's at these times, temperature drops quite a lot through the night, and it's the perfect sort of recipe for mist. So, you know, places like, um, I forget the name, Mantor, and Mantor in the Peak District and places like that are renowned for it. Uh, one or two places in Dales, but, you know, you you get out. It's all, look, you can't, you can't predict that it will definitely... You definitely get it, but when you do, it's fantastic. So, you know, th these kind of conditions obviously help to um, add a lot more drama. And so this this scene, you can see the mist um, actually sits in the the gaps in the layers in the landscape. It's looking from um, near Settle, a place called Pfizer, uh, and looking over to Atamaya Scar. And Warrendale knots, but it's a long lens which compresses. Uh, I don't know if any of you, any of you, have seen that kind of um, technique or used it, but it basically the, there's quite a distance or a, a bit more distance between each of those layers, but the the longer lens forces them together and, and pulls them in, um, and it, it can be a nice effect on the right the right sort of scene. Yeah, I mean, the weather, obviously, the weather plays such a big factor in landscape photography. Um, and, and we can all talk about it, you know, I mean, we, we all know what bad weather's like, um, but, you know, and, and nobody wants to go out and shoot in um, torrential rain. Uh, but I tend to think, you know, the, the weather... It, it's there's not really any bad weather, as I say, apart from the torrential rain. And and the name of the game is to get out there, find locations that actually work under different weather conditions. You know, I mean, summer storms such as this one at Malham. Um, I think I were walking with my kids that day, um, and a summer storm were coming in. We could see it, and the, the clouds went all sort of weird, you know. Um, managed to get a few shots of this scene. You, you might recognise the little tree there uh, in the distance is the one that you see all the pictures of at Malham. Um, within about 10 minutes, we got an absolute soak in there. Um, but it, it, the weather, without those clouds, I'm not sure this shot would have done so much. There's some nice lines through that limestone. Nice diagonals leading you over, you know, over to the horizon. But uh, without those clouds, it might not have worked so well. The mist again that I mentioned coming into sort of September, October. 
Um, you know, and that, that's obviously a, a fantastic thing. If you can get high above the mist, um, there are times when it, it's like you're sat above, above the clouds and there's not a picture there always straight away. But if you wait long enough, you know, it only takes a little bit of breeze or the sun starts to rise and it starts to break and reveal bits of the landscape. And if you're there in good time, you can actually just pick your moment where it reveals the parts of the landscape that you want it to. And obviously maybe masks other things like the sewage works or whatever it is, you know, that's off in distance there. Um, even rain, I remember taking this shot. This is up above uh, Crackpot Hall, if anybody knows it. Um, but it were raining at this time. You know, and there's not many, it's not always going to be the, the ideal situation when you get rain, but it's surprising that one or two images I've shot, I felt that the rain added to the image. This one, it just gave it a softness and a bit of a mistiness. Um, and it's, uh, it, 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 you know, it's a pain, obviously, having to keep wiping lenses. We, we don't want to damage kit, definitely not. But, you know, certain landscapes, um, they, they do work in, in different lighting, you know, and it's all about adapting to the weather uh, and the conditions. Obviously, quite uh, dramatic rainbows and things like that. You know, nice to kind of, we can't, we can't exactly predict those, but, you know, those, those kind of summer stormy days are, are often good for a rainbow. Um, this one, I think, same as the images I showed you earlier. And I, it didn't matter how I tried, I could not get this rainbow exactly where I wanted it in this shot, but it, it did look, it did look quite spectacular. So it had, it had to be photographed, really. Um, again, passing sort of rain showers up at Scotland, you can see how it, the, the well, in fact, I think it would have been rain and hail this um, last winter and very fleeting. We were getting moments where it's the Papa Glencoe, the, the, the mountain was actually disappearing fully, but then very briefly, you'd get a little opening and, and, and I think it's one of the few times as well where I was snapping handheld because it just, this were going off so quick. Um, but what I liked was the layers again from the, the sort of foreground uh, sort of hill in the, at the front and then those, those diagonal layers going up to the Papa Glencoe. 70 to 200 lens uh, to compress that scene again. And, and but very fleeting, you know, again, if you sat at home and you see that kind of weather, first thing you're going to do is switch telly on and, you know, watch an episode of uh, Strictly Come Dancing, or, you know, and, and not bother getting out there. But, you know, when you actually see the results and it, it's always worth getting out, don't talk yourself out of it. Um, the snow, basically, that we've talked about, again, this is the same the same uh, location as the, the oil seed rape with the lone tree, but a very stark, different sort of image. But you know, winter snow can be really good for that. Um, freezing there. I think we nearly lost the dog, one of kids in a snow drift, but well worth getting out. <laughs> you, you can't beat beat it when you get into get to get some snow like that. Um, so, David, get, David, is it suitable to have a break now? Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah I, I'm, as I say, I was looking for a. I've not got a clock here. I'm sorry about that. I've, I've sort of got, and I, I don't have it on my computer. So, but yeah, that would be perfect. I think if you want to have a break, that's no problem at all. Right. If, you, um, if anybody wants to ask me anything on anything, and um, please fire away. Perhaps if you could stop sharing your screen, then we can see everybody's screen. Right. Yep, yeah, that's uh, just... Oops. Right, there you go. Is that all right? That's fine. It's been really enjoyable up to now, so... Right, great. There's plenty more. <laughs>
I think that is about right. Are you not bad on time, I think? Because that's always my bit of a worry, is that I'll go on too long or, or not quite make it, you know, so. David. Yeah. Do you do, you do a lot of uh, post-processing? Yeah, well, um, my post-processing processing, I'll probably come on to that, but it tends to be more corrective. I mean, yeah, the answer would be that, um, you know, that the images are uh, processed in like Lightroom, Photoshop, but the the aim of the processing is always to get the image um, to a point where it, it, it resembles what I saw, if you yeah. like, because, you know, obviously the camera, we can all, you know, the, 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 that sort of um, idea that the camera captures reality mm. is not really true. So, you know, much of, and I, I want to challenge myself as well. I want to challenge myself to capture scenes that sometimes might be tricky lighting. Some of the best light, it is difficult to capture, you know, either in one frame, even grads, we all know we, you can use grads, but, or, or grad filters, you know, the neutral yeah. density filters are, and they're okay up to a point but you know it would be you'd be limiting yourself now to not learn you know processing up to a certain level mm. things like blending exposures in Lightroom and things like that it, it's just such it's so easy now and simple and it gives such realistic results whereas before um, you may have had to, you know, use all these luminosity masks, all kinds of things to get the same result. It's a lot simpler now, so yeah. I might be a little bit long-winded there, but but yeah, the answer is yes. You definitely do some, but by no means. If if I had to give you an average time that I might spend on an image, it's probably under ten minutes. Yeah. Oh. You know. Maybe yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I, I, no, I, I'd like to. The, the, you know, all those elements have got to be there. I'm really not interested in trying to add things in or anything like that. You know, I need, you need the light to begin with, really. Yeah. You know, or, or, or as I said, the right kind of light for what you're trying to convey. You know, that's the main thing, like, yeah. Thank you. David, are you a member of any camera clubs? No, I'm not. But funnily enough, you know, until all this lockdown, we the, we do have one just down the road at Batley. Um, I think I'm, I was um, due to do a talk for them as well. I mean, it's funny, after all these years, you know, and I've, I've not spoke at my, my local camera club, um, but it is it's something actually I was thinking about, you know, and I've not, Obviously, without lockdown, there's been just a lot to think about, really, and it's not, it's not been at far from. But it, just before we went into it, I'd thought about maybe going down and having a look, you know, because I know we we've got some really good ones um, locally. I don't know if you get. Do you have out to do with Wakefield Camera Club? Uh, well, we haven't. No, uh, we're not um, in the same area. All oh, right, yeah, it'd be a different sort of region then, won't it? There is Yorkshire, Yorkshire Youth. Oh, uh, yeah. There we are. We're in the Nymph, North, uh, North, North East, uh, yeah. Midlands. All right, yeah. Where, where exactly is it, Axholm? It's not, you're still at you're still bottom end of Yorkshire, are you? It's, Do you know where Scunthorpe is? Oh, so it's Lincolnshire. Then. Yeah, we're in Lincolnshire, yeah. 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 Scum, Scumthorpe and Gainsborough were about in the middle. Yeah, I know it pretty yeah. well. I have actually been fishing down there a bit in fens and round that way, you know, at times. Mm. Got some pretty good river. fishing lakes not far from us. Yeah, oh, I think there's, there's some good spots down there. I don't know them all, but I'm seeing them, you know. Do you still fish then now? Well, that's it. I've the photography took over fishing, and and especially when I went full time, I've not done I've not done much, but the lockdown. Yeah. 
Right, so let me go back to. Oh, yeah, it's letting me do all that anyways. Just do. Everybody getting that again? Yeah, we've got it now. Fine. Yes. yes, thanks. Right, so, yeah. So you can't talk, talk about landscape photography, obviously, without sort of touching on the light. And again, um, pretty similar to um, the, 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 you know, the weather conditions. It, it's, a, it's a funny subject because talking to other landscape photographers, um, and this is not just, not just uh, isolated like to light and conditions and things like that. I find it strange how people can be so polarised in the view on one thing, you know, and, and, and like talking to other landscape photographers, you know, I've had people say, well, what's your favourite light, you know, and, and sort of say, well, I've not really got a favourite, you know, there is, uh, why's that not working? My pointer's just not working at the moment for some reason. I think that might be with the kind of stall when it's stalled. Let me just see if I can get it to go again. Ah, there we are. We're back. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think one of the one of the, the, the sort of types of light that everybody associates with perfectly is this sort of low angled side light, you know, and um, it's fantastic, obviously for the right sort of image, you can see this one up Swaledale. You've probably seen similar images from up there, but uh, that kind of side light hitting the, the walls and the, the left hand side of the field barns and things like that, you know, it, it really creates that 3D effect in your images. As I say, and, and the, the thing that surprises me, as I say, is that when I'm, you know, sometimes talking to other photographers, you'll hear them say, well, crap, you know, the light's crap. Uh, we didn't bother, are we, you know? And it, for me, again, it, it seems a bit of a cop-out. Now, I'm not saying that um, it's easy and you can always do it, but... You, the more the more images you take in the more in the more different types of locations, vary locations, you begin to like look at how the light affects certain things. Flat overcast light can be great for um, sort of rocky abstracts, coastal geology, and things like that. Patterns and um, you know, obviously the woodland and things like that, fairly obvious, but the point I'm making is that the more you sort of start to sort of look at light and study it, you begin to fit or match locations to the, the conditions and the lighting. And for me, all of these things um, help me adapt. And the, the, the big point is that they help me enjoy my photography more. I don't, what I don't want to do is kind of go to a location or, or as little as, as often, go to a location um, hoping that the light is going to be this kind of side light or this that you're looking at, colourful, fiery sun, sunsets or whatever. And it not be like, you know, we get the total opposite and that shot doesn't really work. It, it, it ends up being mediocre. What I want to do is look at the weather and say more, you know, I don't want to be up on top of that hill. I want to be down in that uh, boggy marsh near Malmtown, taking pictures of the tex textures of the silver birches and things like that. But the kind of things that are actually working for those conditions. So again, like earlier, it's about adaptation. It's not sort of... Uh, you know, saying, well, the light's no good because it, it, there's no such thing, really. There's always, a, there's always some kind of 
um, image that is going to work. You know, certain lighting is going to make your composition stand out more, depending on on what that might be. Um, this is another one. This is a this is a shot. One of my favourite shots, and for anybody that's been, it, it's um, it's up on Pike Dar Hill um, near Mal at, at Malham, Malham Cove, and I, I always, you know, I like I like trying to get pictures of Malham from a different angle. Now, uh, we all know, you know, dales and dry stone walls is the, the walls are a big feature. Um, now, I don't know if you can just see it. But on the, uh, let me just see if this works. Can anybody see that pointer? Is that where? Yeah, yeah, it's working. Ah, that's good then. This little area, there's a road down there that you go, <laughs> you sort of go up past the cove and, and I'd shot all these walls here from the road quite a few times and th there's obviously masses of them, but it, just the composition didn't really work. And on this, this particular occasion, I thought, well, I'd actually been up on Gordale Scar, which is somewhere over here. It, I were over on top of here. And I noticed this bump, probably that one up here and thought, I knew that there were more walls down here and, and below me there. So I thought, well, I wonder what it, you know, what it would look like from that angle. Um, so at the time, I was in the habit of uh, going out in my camper van and, and you know, I got up here, saw this, and got a bit excited. I did a did this panoramic, uh, which will be a good, I don't know, nine or ten images at least, um, stitched. Um, but I took, I took this shot the night before, and on the strength of it, I thought, I really like how this looks. So I decided I was going to stay overnight in my camper van and get up in the morning um, in the hope of like the nice uh, warm side light. So I did that. And when I got up, this might not be the same angle. It, it's from the same sort of area, maybe just a bit lower down. Um, but you can see the warm, the warm light really on this one. The walls are not really standing out. The pattern of the walls is not, and it, it's not just because of the sort of location, but it, it's the light. And again, it, it's that that sort of um, you know, if if you had, if you were going to choose, if somebody said to you, can have this kind of warm side light or this harsh light overhead, you're probably going to pick that every day. But for this particular shot and what I wanted to get across, that kind of light was not, not the best. You lost the contrast. Um, you, ca you can kind of see again from this, this image, you know, you, you've got um, these shadows, they're actually from clouds rolling over. You can see the clouds there, but I absolutely loved um, that. And I, I don't, let me just see if I can, this is in my way. I don't know if it is in your way, but um, the dark cloud in this area just meant that this little barn stood out down here. And, you know, the light hitting the, the limestone of the wall, limestone when, it, when it's quite bright and it, it tends to stand out light, but it created so much more contrast in this image. And as I say, it's probably my uh, favourite image that I've taken of Malham because I think it's, again, it's my own image. It's quite a original one. And I just love this, this area and so much better than the images I got from down on the road down here. Um, whether I'm supposed to be up there or not, it's another matter. <laughs> But it were worth it were worth walking up for that evening. Um, so yeah, things like that. You know, it's taken a lot of learn, a bit of learning, really. I mean, this this is another similar example. Now I don't have the the other image to compare, um, but I know this was um, it was March. I can't, I can't remember whether it was beginning or 
middle of March in the walls, but it's actually shot after sunset. There's no real light to speak about. You can see the grasses from winter. They've not turned back sort of green. You've still got that, um, you know, dead grass. But you get this contrasty pattern of the, the path. You know, it's a simple image. But again, this is, uh, it's one of those kind of, uh, one of those simple pattern images. I think this is one of the few. It was shot with a 400 millimeter lens. And uh, I, again, I stayed over that night in my van because I, I really liked how the image turned out, hoping for some more interesting light in the morning. I actually got the light, but the, the lovely warm light actually killed the contrast killed the image, you know, and the, that zigzag that I really liked were gone. So again, you know, it's it's one time when flat light that you would sort of call, you know, a bit nondescript, uh, you wouldn't really want to, it, it, it's working probably better, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I am one for kind of laying plans and, and that does, you know, it works well, obviously the you know, getting the maps out, the compass, finding out everything you can find out about a location before you even start. You know, if we know where the sun rises and sets, we know the angle of the light. Um, and that obviously works well. If, if you know an area um, and, and you know where the light's coming from, it, it does take a lot of the messing about. If, you've, if it's somewhere you've visited plenty of times, you, you've got the composition laid out that you, you, you've already tried it. Um, and it's just a matter of the conditions playing ball. I mean, that kind of image, when it works off, you know, you sort of get people say, oh, well, you were in right place at right time there. Wouldn't you like it's a, a stroke of luck? But usually... Um, the reality of it is, is that you've stood in that position, well, who knows how many times before, and you've taken the same shot in rubbish light, but you know that at a certain month of the year, if you're lucky, then you'll get the light, you'll get the image that you want, and you'll get it within 10 or 15 minutes, and you can be sat in cafe having a bacon sandwich and home before everybody gets up. You know, it's as simple as that. Um, obviously, Flamborough there, the arches, you know, we're looking south, uh, a winter image. So the sun's probably actually rising slightly over to the right. But this is that, that period just before the sun pokes out, where you start to see these fiery clouds. And, um, you know, knowing that area, the planning, the, the, you know, knowing where everything is. It works well. Um, this one again. I suppose this one's a bit of a bit of both. It's a bit of a. I know this area really well. It's actually, a, if anybody's been up there, Windskill Stones, which again is just above Settle. Um, but you get lovely views over to Ingleborough, um, and the you know the layers, obviously, are, are work quite nice again. Um, but but just a. Uh, Sunset, knowing, knowing in sort of June and July that the sun drops next to Ingleborough, um, you know that you're in with a shout of getting an image looking over that way. This is obviously Scotland, um, up by near Fort William. Um, uh, and even just looking on things like Google Maps, um, I look sometimes on stock libraries in, in a way my thinking is that a stock library such as Alame, I think they have getting on for, it's certainly over 250 million images on there. Now, as you can imagine, they're not all great images, but often when you look, you can see an image of an area and it'll tell you when it was shot. You can see the kind of light they get that, that that's getting somewhere, where it's coming from or how it's lighting up. 
you know, and straight away you've you've you know more about that location than you did before. Um, a compass, you know, having a compass, it's it's pretty. There's obviously all these apps you can use as well, such as um, photographers ephemeris and things like that. But um, say so there's there's no substitute even just for you know if you carry a compass. Um, winter, obviously, your your sun is the sun's rising uh, and setting, you know, further south. And at the height of, of sort of summer, you know, the, the the sun's setting as far north as it will. So you, you can start to get a picture um, of different locations, you know. Again, Ingleborough here, sun rising in winter. Um, it, it rises behind the hill. Um, pretty lucky with the conditions. This is one of those tilt shift panoramics I was talking about where it's a 24 mil lens, but it'll shift side to side. So you can actually move in and get the textures of the rocks in your foreground and get a nice close foreground, but yet still get that wide panoramic sort of shot and fit, fit you know, all, a, a, quite a wide scene in there. Um, and yeah, one of those mornings, beautiful purple sort of colours over Ingleborough's day started, but um, you pretty much know, I pretty much knew what I was trying to get there. I knew the area I was going to be in. I, have a, I had a rough idea of composition because I've been up there so many times. Knew where the sun was going to be. And it's just a matter of that final piece of the jigsaw, obviously, just dropping into place. Um, and in which, in this case, it Seemed to go all right, I think. Um, another one, this is Windskill, Windskill Stones, I was talking about again. This is actually an image shot in um, December or January, I think it was, but where the, the sun is actually setting um, way over and behind to my left, but the colours spread over. Um, you know, and, and I've sort of shot this composition once or twice before. So knowing that location, it's an easy one to kind of get to, to be fair. You're not far from your car there. Um, so it, 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 it is quite nice and, and easy, you know. So, but again, all those things, uh, building up a knowledge of these locations and planning, Along with the other things, such as the the you know the weather conditions, the light, you begin to get an idea for what's going to work in those different you know set of set of conditions, and uh, and obviously that all that all helps quite a lot. So the flip side of that, this is where I say again, you know, photographers can be really polarized in the view you'll get someone that will say, you know, I don't plan any of my shoots, you know, because it's better to be spontaneous uh, and what have you. And you'll get somebody else who's the direct opposite. But you don't often hear people say, you know, we, we I really try and do both. You know, it's like anything. It, it, it doesn't always work. But um, more opportunities. There's, there's times I know I might know an error, but if I can do a little bit of planning, see an area that I think is nice, have a walk out there, but having no idea what I'm going to come away with, sometimes, you know, you get very lucky. So images like this over, it's um, Thornton and Craven Way, it's just other side of Skipton, and you get all these little rolling hills, but I, I just set off for a walk that morning in an area that I thought looked interesting, Lucky to get fantastic light, that kind of haziness in the background. Um, but totally opportunist, no, I, no idea of what shots I were going to get. And I have to admit, for me personally, I really enjoy that type of photography. So looking at a new location, completely immersing yourself into the, the process, if you like, of trying to work out a new location and find what's going to work. You're challenging yourself. Often, you know, you find nothing or you struggle, 
But, you know, as I say, my outlook on landscape photography is that, well, all right, I've got to make a living from it. So in some respects, I do have to take pictures for other people. But my, my sort of, in my own enjoyment of photography, it's about satisfying me that I've, that I've done as much as I can to get the best image I possibly can. And I find it really rewarding, as I say, when you walk a new location, you know, you can get quite excited seeing one or two bits that really stand out or look good. Um, you know, but when you get an image that you're quite happy with, it's very rewarding. It's much more rewarding than 300 likes on Facebook, not that I'd know about that, but um, it's much more rewarding than all that kind of stuff. You know, it would be easy to follow a bit of a plan uh, and only shoot the, you know, the, the dramatic locations, the kind of honeypot places and, you know, but you, you kind of not, you know, you're not, you're not progressing really. You're not taking pictures for yourself in some ways. So it, as I said, the challenge and the, the process is what kind of drives me. Um, again, you know, if you're going to sort of do this sort of photography, some of the points I made earlier about um, knowing your kit, knowing your equipment inside out, it plays a part again. You know, you're driving along like here over Buster Tubbs Pass. The mist is all sort of burning off and all these layers. And sometimes you've just got a minute or two to jump out of the car, take a quick shot, you know, and you really need to know your, your kit and get everything right so you, you know, you can get the image. Um, you know, and as I say, it, it's pretty rewarding. This is one up above, um, that's Penny Gent in the background, and it's an early summer morning. Um, but again, just, just spontaneous, really. I had a walk. Wasn't seeing much really because it's a bit of a it's, a it's a big area and pretty featureless. But then I quite like the leading of the wall and was really lucky that the mist was just skimming off pen again. But not a planned shot at all and not one I've seen taken before or after. So it's a quite rewarding, certainly for that morning. Um, again, opportunist. Um, certainly, you know, not the most complicated composition, but it were not really, this is bad and moor over Skipton and, and, it, and just driving past to another spot. Um, you could see the rain absolutely bucketing out of these storm clouds. Um, so I just jumped out, quick shot, you know, and uh, in itself, the clouds were just so dramatic. It, it, it had to be done, really. Um, Yeah, another one. This is this is up above um, Simon's seat. If anybody knows that in Wharfdale, uh, and not a not a not an image I expected to take. But you're looking down. I think this was shot at 400 millimeters as well. It's a really distant view that that doesn't look so distant. But I'm up on top of Simon's seat, looking down into uh, I think it's Sky Sky Home from up there. Um, but really like the composition of the, you know, the funny shape of the walls. Farmer had obviously slipped some in his tea before putting putting those walls up, I think. But, you know, they created a lovely shape on those fields and, and blessed with a bit of nice light and frost. So, again, you know, I'd say we got that, that opportunist kind of, again, not the best of compositions, but that, that rain and the cloud and rainbows, um, you know, it, it shows that both both ways are equally equally as productive. There's no there's no rules in landscape photography. None of it's set in stone. Uh, and the further you get away from that, and the more more adaptable, the more fluid you become in your ideas and your thinking, the, your, your images are going to show improvement from it. Um, you'll know this. This is probably a bit of both because I do know. Obviously, this area, it's at Malham. And uh, the, I know the area very well. I drive past there um, a lot. But, 
you know, the, the, when the conditions are like that, it's it's difficult to ignore with the, the sun just, just rising or beginning to rise uh, and the mist just floating around there. It's stunning. So moving on to composition, for me, this is probably one of the most important elements uh, of and certainly a landscape photography. And it's, it's the one thing I like to try and I want to stand out above everything else because it's the part of the image that I'm responsible for, if you like. You know, the, the light and the, the, the weather conditions and everything else. You know, we see so many images with fantastic weather and light, you know, but then you can actually look at the composition and think, well, yeah, is it that complex? Was that so difficult to achieve? You know, and often you said the, 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 the light is often the strongest part of an image, you know, and you're not even responsible for that. So it's kind of in my own uh, my own way of thinking is that I want to have a hand in that photograph, and you know, if somebody likes it enough to sort of um, <laughs> give it a second look, then hopefully there's something in that composition. Um, again, going back to some of those photographers. That I mentioned earlier, Joe Cornish, David Ward, one of the things about those photographers that stands out for me is they're, um, they obviously, they've got a mastery of the light, but what I always think is that some of the best images from some of the, the best photographers, they, it's the composition that stands out and everything around it, such as the light, the, the conditions, if you like, the timing, it's all complementary. It never overpowers the image. It's not just an image of a sunset, if you like, you know, and, and so that's where I kind of aspire to go. I, I obviously want to shoot in nice light, but I want it to be my composition that is the strongest element. And, and the, the, the light and everything else is complementary and it's fitting around that composition. Um, we need to have an absolute clear, defined idea of what subject or subjects we want to capture in an image. Um, you know, and what we're trying to do in reality often, we're trying to, we're trying to like exaggerate elements in a landscape because we're trying to make it look perfect. And it, Obviously, a landscape never is. Um, it, it's quite random, but we're trying to pick out those elements that are more visually interesting than others uh, and, and almost exaggerate them. And composition often in landscape, or not just landscape, but in many things, it's as much about exclusion and what you, what you leave out. Um, you know, so we, we, we're trying to bring... Um, those key elements that, that we find interesting in a landscape to the far, forefront and make them more prominent. Um, we're trying to simplify things, you know. We're trying to simplify and, uh, you know, so we, so we just convey, people say a message, I'm not sure that, on that, but uh, more the view. Or often, you know, images like this one, if, if you think about it, the type of image where you have a strong close foreground, if you show what's at your feet out to the view that you're looking at, when somebody else views that image, it almost transports them there to that point where you were stood. And it's one of the reasons it can work. It's not, it, it can be, they say a bit of a cliche, that type of image sometimes, um, you know, but that close foreground going off to a, a distant sub subject or a focal point, you know, it almost puts somebody on the spot that you stood on. So it, it's probably why it, can, why it can work quite well, you know. Um, yeah, again, you've got to look, when you are composing an image, there's obviously so many ways of, ways of composing an image. And I think we could do a, a, whole, a whole talk on composition. You know, um, but it's often, it's about geometry and curves and lines and things like that. And 
trying to fit shapes together that, that work in a complementary way. Um, the funny thing is sometimes you can have, you, can, you, you don't, in some ways you want to forget what the elements in the landscape are. It, it's not so much that it's a tree, it's a river, it's a rock. It's, it's just the shapes that they create. And sometimes it's not even the shapes of the actual physical things in a landscape themselves. It's the shape of the space between them that might create, a, a, you know, sort of a leading or a shape that, that maybe draws you into the image or creates visual interest. Um, as I say, it, it's very, it's infinite the ways that you, that you can um, compose a landscape, you know, and much more than the 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 you know the 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 rules that rules of composition that we we're, we're sort of taught. Although I, I'm still someone who thinks they're quite a good things like rule of thirds. When you if you're starting out, it's a bit like for me anyway. It's a bit like arranging furniture in a room. It kind of helps you space things nicely in the frame. And I know I work in a way that I, just without thinking about it, I think I naturally um, often sort of start with a rule of thirds composition, but then as my thought process kicks in, I start to rate different elements within that frame and start to look and think, well, this, uh, this, this element looks better than that one. So I start trying to move about and change you know, and improve my composition. But, you know, the, the, it's never, as I said, nothing's ever set in stone. Definitely not the, uh, the rules of composition. It's, it's all about experimentation, trying different things, moving about, walking, you know. Um, you can see the little collection of rocks there, quite nice, but just lovely contrast that day. It's, it's at Bleak Tarn again. Quite a popular location, but um, you know when you've got those sort of conditions, it's pretty difficult to ignore places like that. Um, a local one to me, you can see, you know, talking about these shapes. Uh, I love this area. As I say, it is a, it's quite a, a near um, area to me, just above uh, Todmorden and Hebden Bridge. And what I really liked were this weird. If they're obviously natural rocks over Calder Valley, but it's like a semicircular rock. Uh, if you could see me with my tripod here, I've got a, a long series tripod, which goes, I don't know, probably eight foot or above um, in height. And I were actually stood on a rock over here, perched, trying to get the, the camera up higher and higher on the tripod. So I could get this shape and fit the front of this rock in. I didn't want to sort of crop through it or the, the image just wouldn't have worked. Firstly, I wanted to show that because it, it feels like a start point. That feels like your eye should begin there and travel through that shot, semicircle. And you've, you've sort of got the, the Calder Valley then. It's kind of an opposing circle there, simple. But just the, these shapes of things interlocking, you know, this kind of pattern. I wait until sunset, we're lucky with a, a bit of a pink sky there. And it, it, as I said, the, the composition's really simple, but the actual, <laughs> it, I just wish there were another picture of me behind there. Because I'm, I'm almost trying to perch on the tripod to actually take the picture. It was a bit of a, uh, contortionism to get onto that one. Uh, yeah, I, I sort of mentioned this earlier. I mean, it, it kind of goes along with composition, but you know, it, it's a simple, it's a simple idea. But it took me so long to to grasp. But you know, the landscape or whatever you're shooting, it's not always going to fit into that rectangular box that your camera. Um, text photos in and I, and I know again it's quite easy to crop but I think when we're talking about composition um, one of the big sort of areas that you'll improve is if you try and see images um, while on location 
and do your best to capture them in the format that you are, are thereabouts. Even sometimes it's a, this one is a it's a it's a portrait. It's three shots in portrait, which I knew I could get as a, a crop later. Stitch them together, crop them into a square, and it, it worked much better. Simple composition, but if you look at it, the in portrait I had you know a large amount of dead space in the bottom and the top. If I went landscape, I sort of had similar on the other side, but I actually had the, the broken up concrete jetty creeping in. Um, so square format, you know, works really well, but you, you don't need like cardboard frames. And I, I know a lot of cameras now even have the, you know, you can change the, um, the aspect ratio of your viewfinder, which is great. Why not? But I think if you do it long enough and you really look, and as I said, learn the te camera technique, you start seeing images um, in different formats. It's just a matter of, of actually doing it, you know. You can see here, I basically wanted to just capture um, uh, the, the hotels up here, but as well as both piers. If I shot in, uh, straight landscape, I was cutting a bit more at sky off it. Well, I've got one in landscape, actually. It's a bit tighter, so I, I quite like this. But again, it's three shots in landscape, but all stitched together and then cropped um, to square. Um, and you can see from quite a few of these, I quite like these. These are all taken with a tilt shift, uh, with me again, the beach huts. Flambra, but you know, similar three images. Um, tilt shift panoramic. This one's above there. Uh, Hardcastle Crags, which is just uh, over near Hebden Bridge, Halifax sort of way. Um, and even in those those murky conditions, I like the, the colours in that one. Um, similar five four. If anybody shoots, you know, you often. Um, Try and include a foreground, but the you know the, the wide angle lenses, especially, uh, it can look a bit stretched. Um, you know, and, and five four is another another one that what once you start experimenting, if you begin to see uh landscape, probably in any any photography really, but you start to see in these different formats, you will actually start to see more. Um, opportunities, more compositions while you're out, uh, rather than, as I said, trying to make, we're never going to be able to make the landscape, we're never going to force it to fit in that rectangular sort of three, two or four thirds box all the time. So, you know, the, the thinking in different formats or trying to see in different formats is the, the, the way to look at it really. Um, you can see Isle of Egg, Scotland, the favourite, a weird, weird coloured uh, sunrise, a bit like, a, I thought it a bit like an oil slick. Really nice. But that's another one, 5-4 is a landscape, but again, um, these are portrait images with a tilt shift lens that are stitched together. Um, if ever has been up there, Flamborough sort of area, you know, um, coming into... I think this was shot in April, so not far off, but you, the sea there, you do, it does get this ridiculous blue colour to it. Once it, you know, if it's been quite calm, um, it could be, you know, when it's been windy and choppy, it can be brown, but if you get nice, clear, um, still sort of days leading up, you get the sea thrift on the cliffs, uh, blue skies, uh, you know, and it, it, it's a Gorgeous place. Um, so yeah, just coming on, we're, we're getting through quite a bit of it now. Panor panoramic images, um, obviously. Again, this this all sort of melds into the different formats as well, but um, landscape especially. I, I, I think it's such a shame that, you know, we don't see as many prints now. You know, maybe yourselves you do because you're in camera clubs, so uh, often the compositions I probably do print. But 
more often than not, people are viewing images on, on screens or even worse, on mobile phones, you know. So panoramics uh, are one of my favourites because it, it feels like when you're trying to compose a panoramic, you often, you're including so much more. And it's even more of a challenge. You're challenging yourself more. Um, but when you actually print them as well, to see them coming off the detail when they come off print are sort of a metre wide and things like that. It's fantastic, you know. And I mean, I love, as I said, the challenge of trying to create these um, images with a, you know, like Yorkshire Wolves here, the rolling fields, the patterns. And th this is that same field, believe it or not, again. Um, and you know, with a with a low evening light on it, it just looks amazing. It's uh, early summer that, but it's actually not that. There's there's less than six weeks, I think, between that image and the one I showed you earlier with the with all the cut hair. You know, so um, it's just changing so much. But panoramic definitely definitely worked on that spot. Um, this is Christmas Day, a couple of years back, but you can see um, I shot a, a, a standard image of this, I think, as well. It's up above uh, Lock Leaven. You've got the Papa Glencoe, if anybody knows it, up here. Um, and as usual, when I we went on a, a little, we stayed up there over Christmas, uh, family, and for probably... Most of the sort of week we were there, the weather was just rubbish. And it just so happened, like it does, you know, when you want to sit there and, uh, I don't know, drink drink whiskey and eat, eat your turkey, the weather was best day on Christmas Day. So we, we had our dinner and headed out and uh, got a bit of a reward with all this mist coming through. But panoramic, I think this one is a... Uh, uh, I'm going to say, is it a two to one? Again, the formats, you know, I shoot sort of, I try to stick to standard formats such as two to one and three to one with panoramics. But this one looks, not sure if it looks like it might be a slightly odd format, but mainly I try to stick to those formats. Um, what you do find with uh, panoramics, the reason they often work it, it's giving you the two elements. There's two elements to them that you can't get with a standard lens when you think about it, because we can use a long lens that compresses elements. Like here, you know, we've, by using like a 70 to 200 lens, we've actually compressed all this scene. I'll show you. I know I'm using this pointer quite a bit. Um, but we've pulled Ingleborough into the viaduct, you know, and, and pulled it into these arches by using the long lens. But obviously, if we just took a standard sort of image, then we can only capture a narrower area of that image. So by, by doing a panoramic, we get the benefits of kind of two lenses in one. We've got the wide angle perspective but we've got the, uh, the compressed perspective that a long lens gives us. So, you know, as soon as you start to realise those, the, the elements that are actually making it work, you start to look for them again. It's like you, your options are widening when you're out and you're, you're looking in the landscape. You're starting to see images everywhere. You're not standing there thinking, right, what, what's going to work? You know, your options are starting to, to broaden. And certainly panoramics for me are, I don't know, they're right. My favorite, favorite sort of images. You can see again, this is quite a simple composition, but almost with those conditions, you're standing there thinking, I want more. <laughs> you know, I want to capture, capture more of it than I, than I can in a standard frame because, you know, the mist spreading all up, up the valley and, you know, the, the, it's quite indulgent, you know, you, you, the panoramic just gives you even more on that, that standard. 
sort of image, you know. Again, I mean, composition wise, uh, I think you can see from this one, I really liked all this shape. The challenge here, if anybody's been up there, uh, it's on Rannock Moor, and this is the Black Mound, and I believe they call it, it's a belt of Venus when you get this pinkiness in winter. It's absolutely gorgeous how it contrasts with snowy conditions. But the challenge here um, is to find a composition where these islands don't kind of interfere with each other and get in the way, and it, it can be quite tricky. Um, but the more you move about, and you find this spot. I'm really happy with this image. As I say it's a, it's a shame. It's one of those places that's really popular. Um, you see a lot of images of it. So I think a lot of time when people look at, say this image is, oh yeah, it's another shot of Rannock Moor, but it took me quite a bit of work to actually find uh, an area that I could show this, um, you know, these, these islands without kind of blocking each other off. And, the pano format to take in the mountain and everything. It was uh, just a fantastic morning. So another one of my favourites, this is Crummockdale. Uh, and again, you can see these two, well, really the three elements are what I wanted in my picture. These two kind of crags quite domineering on my left here. And, you know, but I loved how this wall just snakes out of the, the edge and round, and I, you know, I always saw it as a panoramic. This is Pennyhen over at one of those times. Um, if you do get out wherever you go, but the lakes, the, the dales, wherever, um, I find you get these days in summer where you can have like blue skies behind you and dark clouds in front. So the light is coming through and hitting your foreground and areas, but then it looks all quite menacing in background and they're fantastic conditions. Really lucky with this one, but, you know, um, again, it, it's one of those where I wanted more, <laughs> you know, I wanted more than, a, than just a, a, a standard 3-2 shot. Um, there tends to, it tends to be hard to use a wide angle lens around here, unless, unless you get onto one at wide... Um, limestone pavements over here but that is for anybody who's not been up there it's quite a challenging area but it's one of the most dramatic locations in my opinion in in Yorkshire you know about as close to sort of Scotland as we get really um again that woodland you know you can see panoramics bit of misty woodland the you, you, you know as soon as you start looking you'll see them everywhere and you can start to assess in your own mind what what you think is going to be the best composition for the area you, you, you're sort of uh, working, you know. Um, so this, this is one of my interesting sort of theories over um, the last few years. And a lot of these shots, they're not going to be ones that you'd hang on your wall. Um, but I remember when, when I was younger, we had a lesson at school. I mean, it wouldn't be the same as what it would be now. But we did a lesson called geometry, which is obviously part of maths. But all we ever did, we drew geometric shapes in a book. We, had a, we, we were given a, um, a geometry set and we made like uh, semicircles, triangles and all sorts of stuff. Coloured them in and... Uh, I remember really enjoying that. Now, this sort of photography, trying to find lines, curves, shapes, pattern, geometry in a landscape. As I say, I don't know whether it always kind of um, transfers to what people are going to call an amazing image, but it's very rewarding. And But it, it, it also, it's really training your eye. You're really developing your eye. Now you see like here, simple, we've got these triangular lines, we've got these diagonal lines all meeting and a curve coming around. Very simple, but again, you're, you're looking in that landscape, selecting a lens that allows you to isolate an area that, that just has pleasing shapes and pattern. 
And the thing I believe, it's kind of like training. You're training your eye um, to bring things down to the lowest common denominator. You're, you're simplifying the landscape. And the more you do it, I honestly believe that when you approach a more complex um, scene, maybe a wider landscape, you really start to see where your boundaries of your image should be, what where you need to, you know, exclude certain items and include others. You, you, it begins to begins to focus and develop your eye. I really believe that. As I say, some of these images might not be for everybody's taste. I don't know, but you know, another field in the world's there and a bit really weird, but a long lens reminded me of one of those seventies brown iron jumpers that one but um as i said it's just developing your eye around these curves and shapes and patterns and i, I really enjoy this kind of thing as i say and, you know you see there the light helps there that black and white image i think that's a it's either stades or robin hood's bay i think that one might be robin hood's bay but even just the the shapes and patterns of the uh, you know, the houses and immersing yourself in it, you'll find yourself um, moving your camera, you know, the, the slight inch in it and, you know, trying to include it, include what you want in there, get the pattern and exclude little parts. And I say it, it's thoroughly rewarding, but it is very good for sort of developing your eye. And, I, you know, you can see from this one a bit of a, strange sort of image that's at sperm point which is probably the nearest place to you that's a fantastic location uh, and i can walk about around there for hours just with a handheld even just with a 70 to 200 picking out details in the you know the sea defenses the sand uh you know wave patterns and all sorts of stuff as you know you know um but yeah, I mean, that, that particularly, I think it is, I, I, I'd like to tell people it's like ninja training for your brain. You kind of, um, you're not going to create a masterpiece that everybody's going to be, uh, you know, fawning over. But it is very good, I think, for developing your eye and helping you simplify landscape in what might be a, a much more complex scene. Um, I think we're getting quite near the end now. You can see again, some of these are the, the, the sort of detail shots. And I hope everybody's getting this. Now these are, it's in a similar vein, but where are some images I think don't always work or they're not always amazingly strong on their own. I love this idea of, you know, panelling images together um, into a bit of a collage and they kind of they get all those little details of an area. These are from Northumberland, but, you know, they really just sum up the area for me, all the, you know, the fantastic geology, the sort of decaying wood of some of the boats, the, the lobster pots and, um, you know, and, and it, it, they, they just work together often. Um, these are with a longer lens, 70 to 200 at least. And I think one or two of them, such as the uh, the lobster pot images, um, such as these with a the shallow, shallow depth of field edge, they were with a, a Lumix four thirds camera and a 400 lens, uh, 100 to 400 which obviously on a, on a Lumix four thirds turns into a, an 800 mil lens. So you could really isolate the, the pattern, you know, but I, I, again, it's one of those um, types of photography. We, 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 all, we all do it because we enjoy it. And it's one of those sort of exercises that you can really immerse yourself in, just capturing details, not, not thinking too, too widely what you're going to try and achieve just look for pattern look for detail um, and it's fantastic practice and obviously sticking them in a panel like this as i say i, I really enjoy that 
that thing of trying to get images that that work together. I'm not sure about these ones again, but I, I liked the sort of panel. And again, you can see, I think patterns in limestone can be difficult to sort of do, but you know, we don't want it to be easy. Are we not learning? You know, we, we've got to challenge ourselves and some of the harder stuff to do that, as I say, that, that is the, the thing that, that I enjoy and it keeps me it keeps me interested and keeps me focused. If I, if suddenly we sort of said, "All right, I know I know it all now, and you know we know what we're doing," I'd quickly lose interest. I've got to feel like I'm still learning and I'm still improving every year, or I'm adding I'm adding kind of new layers of uh, the way I see the landscape, you know, or some new new way. And and these are all things for me that I've thoroughly enjoyed because. It, they're obviously a little bit different to my sort of wider landscape and things like that. Um, you know, so, so final bit, and hopefully, I hope you're not all asleep, but just final bit, few favorite images. I mean, I have, um, I've shown quite a few probably throughout anyway, but I mean, this one you'll see, it's not a favorite image because um, oops, what did I do there? Moved on, I think. Oops. Um, it's a favourite image really because it taught me a lesson. A lot of my favourite images, I either learned something or I just really enjoyed taking them. It's not really about what others think about them. But this one kind of learned me because you, you'll have seen this scene a hundred times, if, if not a thousand, looking down steps at Whitby and... As landscape photographers, we always turn our nose up and think, well, I want to, you know, it's been done a thousand times. And But it was one that taught me a lesson more in business, I suppose, because taking it, people like that scene for, uh, you know, the public loves that scene. And as it turns out, this one just sells as a print, or it did do, um, recently has been a bit quiet, but it, it sold as a print. Um, from when I first took it so many times um, you know when I think back I, I, I never you know you're always looking for something different but it taught me really I suppose that you know to, to sort of uh, make sure I did photograph scenes that are well known by you know public at large and everything um, this one I think I showed you earlier but again one of my favourite Dale's images probably because I feel like it's mine. I've not seen a similar or the same shot. And the area where it's taken, I'm I'm at Keld, if anybody's been up there. There's like a toilet block at the side. And it it was one of those images. I didn't see it perfectly in my mind. I kind of parts of it I must have seen and I, I you know I put the took the image, it was quite a squeeze because there's some TV aerials in that dip. Um, but probably 10 images, shot in portrait, stitched together. The light were coming from behind, that from Kisden Valley. And I just loved it. it again, it sold quite well as a print, but, um, you know, it prints lovely, the light and everything aligned that morning. But more, of more as I said, the, the composition is what I were more happy with these uh, these two I've shown you earlier but again you know learning something new I, I'd said to myself I want to get more I, I want to adapt more you know when the conditions are not working I don't want to stand there and sort of give in and say you know there's no images to be shot today we shot these while I mean at this point it was actually raining gray and overcast uh, and there are, there are a couple of my favourite recent images, if not favourite images that I've taken, because, again, I think we spent around four hours or five hours from low tide um, to the tide creeping back over these rocks. And it, it was running a workshop at the time, um, but the guy who I was with wanted to see me kind of work as well. And... and the, when you immerse yourself in trying to compose an image and such as the, this um, type of thing, you can spend four hours 
and it passes in like the blink of an eye. And it's that that I've enjoyed a lot about photography, especially when I worked in engineering and uh, were not that happy in my job. I kind of, you know, it were an escape from that. And the, that immersive part is what I needed to focus on something and just take your mind away from everything. And I say, so I, I really like those two images because they're a bit of a, a bit of a, a change from my normal stuff and moving on. And, and again, the challenge, keeping that challenge fresh. Uh, showed you this one earlier, obviously, Castle Howard. I, I think it's just the colours and the, the mood that I like in that image. Because it, again, it's not a it's not a typical scene, you know, we've not got leading lines, we've not got, you know, rocks in the foreground, we've not got sun coming up, and, you know, nothing garish there. It's just those subtle summer colours of a, you know, a, a gorgeous English landscape. And I, you know, so that, that's another favourite for me. Might not be everybody else's, but I, I quite like that one. Oh, the one I showed you earlier, I suppose these ones are quite new. It's quite a new one. And this is the, the field I was telling you about. I mean, I did show in that last few, I forgot to mention, but there were another shot of this field. I must have 20 different images and but all sort of geometric patterns and curves and lines. And it, it's absolutely stunning. And I can't wait to get back there. Um, we will be back there soon anyway, hopefully in a few weeks. And as long as Boris don't put a poo-poo on it, but um, yeah, uh, one of my favourite places. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking now because I'm sure most people are like struggling to stay awake. Um, so again, if anybody wants to ask any questions, uh, Yeah, I think we're back. Is that, that right? Yeah. So yeah, if anyone wants to ask any questions at all, <laughs> and don't really have to do, but. <laughs> yeah, David, where, where, oh. It's you. David, where did you take all those rocks that you had in the panel? Where? where... <laughs> they, they were all Northumberland. Um, the various different places. Um, like, have, have you been up to Northumberland? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you've got basically the main ones. We've got Craster. Uh, yeah. Um, Craster, Craster Harbour. Mm -hmm. um, Cullinose Point, which is up at, just along at, um, that's Howick, other way from Howick. Um, which others have we got on there? The main ones, uh, I, I take quite a few, all the bits of wood and stuff like that, probably around, Be uh, you've got Beadnell Bay, Beadnell Harbour, um, and Lindisfarne. And then the, I don't know if you mean those, oh, I'm not sharing the screen now, but the, those two rocky ones, that's one of my favourites, it's at Spittle yeah. Beach, if you know that. At, um, it's at Berwick upon Tweed. Oh, right. Okay. And it's down. The best way to explain it, you've got the, you've got like the, do you know, have you been up to Berwick? We have. Yes. Yes. But do you know where the little rocket, um, the lighthouse, there's a little lighthouse on end up here? Mm. No, never, uh, not, maybe not. No, maybe not that bit. <laughs> maybe well, not that well. It's like a little rock, but basically the rocks are on the opposite side. There's like a, there's like a, what do you call it? Like a promenade with a like an arcade and a cafe. There's not a lot up there, mm. but it's on that side because I know when I first went up and trying to find them, it's not hard to realise. And one of the other things about them that's frustrating, those rocks get buried under the sand sometimes. Oh, right, okay. If you've had more slightly more stormy weather it tends to push the sand off them mm -hmm. and they are fantastic. You can spend hours just oh, getting shots of the patterns, you know, in the rocks. They're, have a look and see. They are amazing. Yeah, if you're up there, just have a look. But as I say, if, if you... 
You do. You have, you have to get on where the promenade is and not the pier. It's like over opposite side of the estuary. And there's okay. a big beach. The beach sort of slopes down. And they're, they're on the southern end of the beach. So looking like south. Right. You'll, okay. you'll find you'll find they're like sandstone, you know. Yeah, I'll have a look. Yeah, yeah they're they are fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions, anybody? Uh, if I uh, ask one, it's Martin. Yeah. Yes, Martin. Yeah, yeah. Hi, David. Hi, um, David. Just trying to work it out. It's what about five years ago that you took Alan and I out for one yeah, of the yeah. workshops. And thoroughly enjoyed it, and I thoroughly enjoyed the speech and <laughs> your lecture tonight. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, there was a lone, lone tree in amongst mist, which is one of the uh, later lone tree images you showed. Whereabouts was that taken? In mist. Let me just have a look. Uh, <clears throat> lone tree in mist. Yeah, it's... Uh, Probably the last lone tree image you ah right, yeah. Well that one, you mean the one that were like panoramic? Yeah. Yeah, it's like a copse of trees. There's about four or five trees there that look like one. The one on the mound, and it, it's on the way up to Malham. Malham. I think we we will have I think we went to Malham, did we? Uh doesn't ring um, a bell. We we, we we did Robin Hood's Bay, Whitby and um uh, stays, uh, stays. Oh, yeah. did you? I wasn't sure. I thought it was Dales, but yeah, it's it's a, a place called Ayrton. Ayrton. If, if you're driving up to Malham, um, especially like getting into like autumn and winter, it's one of those places. There's a tiny little layby. Um, if you're driving past, coming up to sort of sunrise. It can look spectacular, you know, you can get gorgeous. The light at that time rakes across and you get shadows, like big, long side sideways shadows off the tree going over the field. But if you're lucky enough and you get that mist just rolling through as well, it's one of those shots. It, it, there's no... Um, there's no sort of... Uh, you know, you, you're not. It's not a complicated composition or difficult to compose an image, but it just looks effective. You know. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Great place. No, thank you. Anybody else for last question? Okay. Well, what a wonderful night, David. Brilliant. Thank, have I gone on too long, or is that about... No, I don't You've think got so. You, David, you should know that. <laughs> <laughs> we've, still, we've still got uh, 18 people still hanging on, so I don't think it's gone on too long. Oh, you know, good, good. It's, uh, it's been a great night, and we've seen lots of different types of photographs. I yeah. I took an interest when I, I started seeing most of your uh, landscapes were in portrait. Yeah, there are quite a few. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yes, wonderful. And thank you very much, uh, David. Oh, no, thank you. Brilliant. I'm glad you've enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, very good, David. Very good.